Thank you very much, Avi and Stephen. We will now start with the opening lecture about inequality in health from an international perspective by Professor Sir Michael Marmot. Sir Marmot has been a professor of epidemiology at University College London since 1985 and is the director of the UCL Institute of Health Equity. He is the author of health, The Health Gap, The Challenge of an Unequal World, and also The Status Syndrome. He is the advisor to the WHO Director General on Social Determinants of Health in the new WHO Division of Healthier Population. Distinguished visiting professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the co-director of the CUHK Institute of Health Equity. He is the recipient of the WHO Global Hero Awards and many other awards, and also he has 19 honorary doctorates. Thank you very much, and we welcome you to the stage. Thank you. <clears throat> I was talking to Nadab Dabirich the other day, and I said, I envy you the stability of your politics. <laughs> um, you keep having elections and end up with the same prime minister. We don't have elections and keep changing prime minister, <laughs> uh, which in a way is relevant to what I'm going to talk about today. I do want to give something of a global perspective. And then I want to talk about the UK as an example, maybe as an example of what not to do. The opening line of my book, The Health Gap, my book, The Health Gap, <laughs> was why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick, particularly at the time of a pandemic. We think a great deal about the health care system, and rightly so. But we need to focus on the conditions that make people sick in the first place, the social determinants of health. Life expectancy at birth for OECD figures. Does this? It shines on my hand, it just doesn't shine on there. Um, <laughs> well, uh, that's Japan up there, the one at the top. Uh, it's ranked in order of male life expectancy. Israel looks pretty good. You... Hi, Ted. <laughs> I'll use the pointer to point. Um, <coughs> Israel looks pretty good, um, not the best. Uh, say uh, Japan is right up there at the top, Switzerland. But of course, Israel looks pretty good, but the issue is uh, the inequalities within Israel. Uh, life expectancy at birth for Palestinians and Jews, particularly for men, the gap has actually got bigger. It's improved for both, but it's improved more rapidly for Jews than for Palestinians. So, yep, Israel looks very good. But, as with all countries, the challenge is the inequalities within countries. The gap in life expectancy between people with highest and lowest education, for males, the, the red, and the white diamonds for females, such a pity that I can't get this thing to point. Um, anyway, the red is for males and the white diamonds for females. Okay, use the mouse. And the biggest inequalities tend to be in the former communist countries of Central and Eastern Europe, the Czech Republic, Latvia, Hungary, Poland, Estonia, the Slovak Republic. The other interesting thing with this is that the international differences for people with the highest level of education are much smaller than the international differences 
for people with the low level of education. In other words, they do know how to get good health in Estonia. People with university education get good health. If you think that health is a matter of personal choice, then for goodness sake, don't choose to be born to parents of low education. That's a terrible choice to make. But if you're gonna make that stupid choice, then do it in Sweden. Uh, don't do it in Estonia. Um, because, but you see the differences, if you're gonna have low education yourself, do that in Sweden, don't do that in Estonia. And that's really interesting because we see similar things in Britain. In Britain, we've got a social gradient, the greater the deprivation, the shorter the life expectancy. For people in the least deprived 10%, there's no regional variation. If you're rich, it doesn't much matter where you live. The poorer you are, the more it matters. And it's a very similar phenomenon across Europe. 1948, we had the WHO Constitution and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. 1978, Almerata, and by the way, this little potted history I'm giving you um, came from J.W. Lee, who was the Director General of WHO when we launched the Commission on Social Determinants of Health. And he said in 1975, when we launched it, it would be, its final report would be 60 years after the WHO Constitution, 30 years after Alma Arta and Health for All, and he said, we're looking for something of similar ringing clarity. I don't know that we quite delivered that. I chaired that commission, but we put on the cover, social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And we set out an agenda for social determinants of health. It was unusual for WHO, and it was certainly unusual for health ministries, and indeed for governments. And we said we wanted to create a movement for health equity. Perhaps the fact that you're having this conference and you've invited me here, it means this is part of the movement for health equity. As I said, on the cover, we put Social injustice is killing people on a grand scale. And we put at the heart of what we were trying to achieve, empowerment. And we thought of empowerment in three ways. Material, if you haven't got the money to feed your children, you can't be empowered. Psychosocial, having control over your life. And political, having voice. And empowerment relates to individuals, to communities, and indeed to whole nations. And following the Global Commission, I was invited by Gordon Brown, who was then Prime Minister of the UK. How can we translate the findings and recommendations of your Global Commission to one country, England? And I produced what was known as the Marmot Review, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. We then did a commission for the European region of WHO. Israel is a member of the European region. The review of social determinants and the health divide in the WHO European region. And I remember coming to a WHO meeting in Jerusalem to talk about that commission report. The conceptual framework of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health, we have the distribution of health and well-being, material circumstances, social cohesion, psychosocial factors, behaviors, biological factors, and the healthcare system. And those vary by social position education, occupation, income, gender, ethnicity, race, and there's the socioeconomic and political context. We said in our report, inequities in power, money, and resources 
give rise to inequities in the conditions of daily life. And then I was invited to chair a commission of the Pan American Health Organization, Equity and Health Inequalities in the Americas. This is a remarkably general finding. If you put GDP per capita on the x-axis and life expectancy on the y-axis, at low levels, these are data from our PAHO Commission report, at low levels of national income, uh, income is PPP, purchasing power parities, so adjusted for purchasing power. There's a steep relation between national income and life expectancy. If Haiti got as rich as Bolivia, the life expectancy would probably improve towards that of Bolivia. Bolivia got as rich as Brazil, life expectancy would probably improve. But then when you get up to the Costa Rica, Cuba, Chile level, there's simply no relation between national income and life expectancy. The United States of America has marginally lower life expectancy than Costa Rica, despite having a gross national income now of $60,000, and Costa Rica is more like $17,000. You go from $17,000 out to $60,000, and you don't get any improvement in health. That's quite important. That's quite important. The route to better health for a country is not getting richer. It's action on the social determinants of health. I'll say in passing, I'm not going to talk about it today, but I mentioned $17,000 per head. Life expectancy for men in Costa Rica is 77 years. In a poor part of Baltimore, Maryland, the average income in that poor part of Baltimore is $17,000. This is adjusted for purchasing power, and yet the life expectancy is 62, 15 years shorter than in Costa Rica. It's not the absolute amount of income that's so crucial. It's what you can do with the income you have the social circumstances surrounding you. And in the Americas, there's the social gradient. In cardiovascular disease, in Brazil, in Porto Alegre, classify the area of residence, and the lower the level, socioeconomic level of the district, the higher the cardiovascular death rate. That social gradient could be what we've observed in the UK. The attributable CVD deaths are attributable to having a socioeconomic level below the very highest. And 45% of all cardiovascular deaths in Porto Alegre are attributable, 45%, this is not a footnote to the causes of heart disease, are attributable to having a socioeconomic level below the top. And as I said, getting richer isn't the solution. Here's life expectancy for the OECD aggregate, and there's the United States. The diversion has been going on for some time, but then it actually declined a little bit. While the rest of the rich countries, life expectancy went up. So the gap is enormous. Now this goes up to 2015. The gap has only increased further. Life expectancy by year of birth for men at age 50. So men who were born in 1920 are 50 in 1970. Men who were born in 1950 are 50 um, 2000. By deciles of income, there's the gradient. So life expectancy for men was going up a little bit in the poorest 10% and 
And then the richer you were, the bigger the increase. That's men. I don't want to spoil your Monday morning, but are you ready for the next slide? That's women. Life expectancy going down in the poorest 10%, in the next, the next. Life expectancy going down in the poorest 30% of women, life expectancy at age 50, and huge increase in inequality. You can't get overall improvement in health if 30% of your population is having a decline in health. Inequalities in mortality in the US and Costa Rica. And you can see the inequalities are much steeper in the US than they are in Costa Rica. I have already given you the example of Baltimore. I was then invited by the Eastern Mediterranean region of WHO to chair a commission for them. I said, I couldn't possibly do it. And they said, why not? I said, I don't know anything about the region and I'm far too busy. And they said, perfect characteristics for the job. Um, and it's an equity issue. You did it for the European region. You did it for the Americas. You have to do it for us. So i uh, working with good colleagues in North Africa and the Middle East. We produced Build Back Fairer, Achieving Health Equity in the Eastern Mediterranean region. I have to explain to people who aren't from this part of the world why it is that Israel's in Europe and all the other countries are in the Eastern. And I have to explain why Pakistan is in the Eastern Mediterranean and why Morocco is in the Eastern Mediterranean. So WHO and geography don't sit very well together. <laughs> and this was the conceptual framework for our Eastern Mediterranean uh, report, very similar to the WHO Commission. We have structural drivers, conflict and its consequences. Half the countries in that region have conflict at any one time economic and commercial, culture and society, and the natural environment, the conditions of daily life, health equity, and dignified lives. And we use this phrase, do something, do more, do better. If you're Djibouti, Somalia, which are part of the Eastern Mediterranean region, and doing nothing on social determinants of health, it's not hopeless, do something. Get clean water, that would make a difference. If you're thinking in the European region, if you're the Czech Republic, Slovakia, and doing things, do more. And if you're Norway, do better. So there's something here for everybody. And we talked about governance and political cultures, policies, and research and monitoring. And it's the same phenomenon of the Preston Curve. At low levels of income, there's a steep relation between income and life expectancy, but you get up at this level and go all the way out to UAR and Qatar, and Qatar, 92,000 um, national income per person at purchasing power parities. And there's no relation between income and life expectancy once you get above a threshold. You mentioned in the introduction that we set up an Institute of Health Equity at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So this is from the Western Pacific region of WHO, where I will be going next week. And Hong Kong now has longer life expectancy than Japan. Quite astonishing. And big inequalities within Hong Kong, income inequalities. So it's a big challenge to us to try and work out what on earth is going on there. Let me take you back to the UK. I told you that we published the Marmot Review in 2010, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. In February 2020, 
on the 10-year anniversary of publication of Fair Society, Healthy Lives, we published Health Equity in England, the Marmot Review 10 years on. We looked back what had happened in the last 10 years. And the easy answer is we lost a decade, and it shows. This is life expectancy going back to 1980. It had been improving about one year every four years for women and for men. And in 2010, there was a break in the curve and the rate of improvement slowed dramatically. What happened in 2010? This is when we used to have elections in Britain, change prime minister with elections. We had a new government, a conservative-led coalition government, and they said, the number one priority is austerity. And my blood runs cold because they, the new prime minister in Britain is laying the ground. When the minister of finance gets up this Thursday, he's going to say austerity. And we know what austerity does. People's health stops improving. Inequalities in health got bigger. I talked about the gradient. The gradient got steeper. And life expectancy for people in the poorest 10% went down. That's what austerity does. Paul Krugman, the American economist, talks about the confidence fairies and the bond vigilantes. Their politicians talk about confidence fairies. Well, we've got to take these tough decisions or the markets won't have confidence in us. And the bond vigilantes, they'll drive up the price of, well, the bond price will go down, the yields will go up, bonds will be less attractive. So we've got to take these tough decisions. And we're hearing this same rhetoric all over again, 12 years later, and it's going to have the same disastrous effect. In my 2010 review, I had six domains of recommendations. Give every child the best start in life. Education and lifelong learning. Employment and working conditions. Number four, really radical. Everyone should have at least enough money to lead a healthy life. Number five, healthy and sustainable communities environment, housing, and social determinants of prevention. So what happened post-2010? The government said they wanted to cut public expenditure. That's making cuts. And they did it. In 2009-10, public expenditure was 42% of GDP. And over the decade, that 42% became just over 35%. In my 2010 review, I coined the rather awkward phrase, proportionate universalism. I was trying to combine a typical Anglo-Saxon approach to policy making. You focus on the worst off, means-tested benefits and a more Nordic approach, which is universalist social policies. So trying to combine them, I said proportionate universalism. We want universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. So if this was the social distribution, less deprivation, higher life expectancy, it's a gradient. If we focus only on the worst off, we miss the health disadvantage of people higher up the gradient, but not at the top. So I said, universalist policies with effort proportionate to need. We could call it leveling up. What did we get post 2010? The gray bars are local government spending per person. In the least deprived 20% of areas, the spending per person post 2010 went down by 16%. And then, the more deprived the area, the greater the reduction. In the most deprived 20%, the spending went down by 32%. What we've got here 
is effort inversely proportionate to need. The greater the deprivation, the greater the need, the greater the need, the greater the reduction in spending. Could this have played a role in the slowdown in health improvement, the increase in health inequalities, the decline in life expectancy in poorest areas? Yeah, I think it could. I won't go through all six of my recommendations, but child poverty. Defining child poverty at less than 60% median income. Before housing costs, 18% of children were in poverty in 2010. After housing costs, housing so expensive, 27% of children were in poverty. And that 27% went up to 30%. Child poverty went up. How was that achieved? These are changes in net household income due to tax and benefit reform. So it's not what actually happened, but what the effect of the tax and benefit changes would be. So the red is working age with children by household income decile. If you were in the poorest 10% of household income, your income would have gone down by 20% as a result of changes to the tax and benefits system. If you were in the second poorest 10%, your income would have gone down by 12%, and then the richer you were, the less the reduction. Some reduction at the top, but nowhere near as big as the reduction lower down. Government policy was to make poor people poorer and to increase inequality, and it worked. And guess what? Health suffered. What a surprise. And they're gonna do it again. I'm sorry if I feel a bit annoyed about this. I was interviewed for a podcast um, on Sunday, Saturday, whenever it was, Friday. Um, that's going out this week about the effect of austerity. And we've been writing about this, publishing that austerity had a very bad effect on the health and well-being of the country, including inequalities. And she said, if the Chancellor, George Osborne, the minister, was in this conversation, he'd say, but we had to do it because of the state of the public finances. What would you say? I'd say, he's wrong. It was a political choice. We did worse than the G7 countries. We took this choice, and the slowdown in life expectancy improvement was more marked in the UK than in any other rich country except Iceland and the United States. We really didn't have to do this, and we did it. Child poverty, slightly different measurements. Um, for the rich countries, 41 countries. It could be Iceland, Czech, Denmark, Finland, 10 or 11% of children in child poverty. The UK ranks 31 out of 41 countries. The US ranks 38th, and Israel actually ranks lower, worse, than the US with high levels of child poverty. That's storing up problems for the future. Public spending on early child education and care. The average for the OECD countries is $6,000 per child per year. Norway spends $12,000. The average is six. The UK spends four. And I say to our government people, there we are, limping along, below average, not the worst. The US is worse than we are, and oh dear, there's Israel, 3,000, storing up problems for the future. And you know our politicians like to tell us we're world beating at this and world. We're not world beating at anything. We're just limping along below average. 
and now they want to cut public expenditure further. And here's a social gradient in educational performance from the Program of International Student Assessment. The less deprived, by deciles, uh, the better the performance in France, the OECD average, the US, Hong Kong does remarkably well, Macau, UK, and Israel. Um, a steep social gradient. So I said Israel looks pretty good on life expectancy, but when I look at child poverty and expenditure on early child development and educational performance, big inequalities, much more to do. You can tell me to go home now if you like. <laughs> The difference between advantaged and disadvantaged students in reading. There's Hong Kong, <laughs> it looks remarkably good. Uh, very small inequalities. The UK is not bad for this one, slightly better than the OECD average. The US is worse than the OECD average. Germany, Israel. relative poverty in different levels of poverty of ethnic groups within Israel. So there's different countries, Iceland, and there's Israel, uh, relative poverty, and the Haredim and Arabs. Uh, looks like a different part of the world. Israel looks like Europe, um, but these two subgroups uh, in terms of relative poverty, look a great deal worse. Share of workers in poverty. Is work the way out of poverty? Yeah, it is. In Ireland and Finland and Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Australia. Yeah, not so much in the United Kingdom, even worse in the US, and not so good in Israel. And then, of course, Israel looks pretty good on PM 2.5. Um, annual country level mean concentration of PM 2.5, air pollution. We have to consider that as well. And these countries of Central and Eastern Europe look particularly bad. All this has been a major threat to health inequalities a decade of austerity. A second major threat was the pandemic. People said at the beginning of the pandemic, it will be the great equalizer. Prince and pauper alike will be getting COVID. Garbage, absolute rubbish. Nothing works like that. The pandemic will, we said right at the beginning, expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. Look at these UK data. This is all-cause mortality by level of deprivation. So classify people by where they live, classify where they live by level of deprivation. It's a social gradient. It's not just the poor have high mortality. It's a graded phenomenon. And there's COVID-19. Looks almost parallel to the social gradient in all-cause mortality. Yes, we have to control the virus, vaccination, social distancing, and the like. But we have to deal with the underlying inequalities. And that's the graph I showed you before. That's what happened to life expectancy in 2020 in England and Wales. So we weren't doing very well before the pandemic. And then the effect of the pandemic was a year fall in life expectancy, a year. Pre-2010, life expectancy was improving one year every four years. We lost four years of improvement. We lost about 40 years of improvement for the post-2010 rate, because it was so slow. And I said it would amplify the un underlying inequalities. If you look at the three years, 2018 to 20, in England, compared with the previous triennium by level of deprivation, life expectancy fell 
in that triennium, mainly because of 2020, in the poorest 40% of the population. In fact, for men, it didn't improve at all. For women, it improved in the top 60%. For, but for men and women, it fell in the bottom 40%. And if you look at healthy life expectancy, women living in the most deprived areas of England are expected to live a third of their lives in poor general health. And COVID across Europe would have a big income, a big income effect um, in by decile of income. And the poorer you were, the bigger the drop in income. Had there been no policy changes, there were policy changes. There were furlough schemes and various schemes, but the effect was still the lower the income, the bigger the drop in income. That's the total. So it said it would expose the underlying inequalities in society and amplify them. The poorer you were, the bigger the drop in income. US colleagues looked at this. In the USA, which had already been doing badly pre-COVID, Life expectancy dropped from 2019 to 2020 and fell further in 2021. And then looking at what they call 19 peer countries, the countries that did next worst were Scotland, Northern Ireland, Germany, and England and Wales. What's going on here? Pre-pandemic, in the UK, life expectancy was stalling, inequalities in health were increasing, and life expectancy for the poorest people was falling. And that slowdown in life expectancy was nearly the slowest of all rich countries, except the United States. In the first wave of the pandemic, we had the highest excess mortality, but over the two years, 2020 and 21, we had the biggest fall in life expectancy, except the United States. What's the link between pre-pandemic health and health during the pandemic? And I think it works at four levels. Poor governance and political culture. If you want a definition of what I mean by poor governance, look at what's been going on in the UK since the Brexit referendum. We've lost one, two, three, I've lost count. I think we've had now on our fourth prime minister since the Brexit referendum, six years. In six years, how do we manage that? That's a definition of poor governance and political culture. Increasing social and economic inequalities, the reduction in spending on public services, we're all prepared, and we weren't very healthy coming into the pandemic. So, the second threat to health inequalities was the pandemic. The third is the cost of living crisis. Food insecurity in the UK. Food insecurity is defined as going a whole day without eating, not because it's Yom Kippur, but because you can't eat, not eating when you're hungry or not eating enough to satisfy your hunger. And look at the steep rise in food insecurity. We used to say we were the fifth biggest economy in the world and one in four families with children have food insecurity. One in six families without children have food insecurity. Not being able to eat when you're hungry in a rich country. And then, of course, energy costs. The UK has the biggest gap between the richest and poorest in energy cost as a proportion of income. So the richest 10% in 2022 spend 6% of their income on energy. The poorest spend 18%. Look at France. The rich spend 6%, the poorest spend 10%. 
we have this huge inequality. This is not just a war in the Ukraine. This is inequality, people not having enough money to live. Meanwhile, food and energy billionaires uh, are $453 billion richer than they were two years ago. So some people are doing pretty well out of the cost of living crisis. Unemployment benefits. If you're unemployed in Denmark, you get 90% of your previous earnings. In the Netherlands, you get 75%. In the UK, universal credit, so-called, is 14% of median income. So if you're unemployed, we say, you're going to suffer. And all the rhetoric is, oh, we've got these high tax levels, poor Britain. If you look at government revenue as a percent share of gross domestic product, in Finland, is 52%. In France, it's just under 52%. Belgium, Sweden, Netherlands, 42%. The UK, just under 36%. Not as low as the United States at 31%. But we're a low-tax country. When the Minister of Finance gets up this Thursday and says, I had to make spending cuts. Oh, gosh, it's terrible that I had to do that. I'm so sorry, but I didn't really want He could raise tax by 1% of GDP. He could bring us up to the OECD average, fill his so-called fiscal black hole, and not cut a single penny from public expenditure. They don't want to do it. They want to cut. That's all pretty depressing. We've been working with local government. After my 2010 report, Coventry, the city, English city of Coventry, declared itself a Marmot city. I had nothing to do with it. They said, do you mind if we call ourselves a Marmot city? I said, what are you going to do? We're going to take your report and we're going to act on it. Early child development, education, employment, working conditions, and so on. Greater Manchester, you've heard of that because football teams. Uh, Greater Manchester said, well, if Coventry can do it, we'll be a Marmot city region. Luton said, we'll be a Marmot town. Waltham Forest said, we'll be a Marmot borough. Cheshire and Merseyside, that's where Liverpool is, said, well, if Manchester can do it, we can do it. Lancashire and Cumbria, Leeds, north of Tyne Combined Authority. Gwent said, we'll be the first Marmot region in Wales. It's pretty exciting stuff. We did a report for Greater Manchester, Build Back Fairer in Greater Manchester, Health Equity and Dignified Lives. That's Cheshire and Merseyside, altogether fairer, health equity and the social determinants of health in Cheshire and Merseyside. And now we were approached by a big insurance company, a financial organization, legal in general. They, I can't even get the words out. They have 1.3 trillion pounds under investment. I didn't buy peaches last week because they were so expensive. A pound of peach, who can afford peach? 1.3 trillion pounds under investment. And they said, we'd like to know if we could do something to improve health and reduce health inequalities, not out of charity, but as a core part of our business. So we produced a report for them. And I'm showing you this was a a healthcare trust, but we said employment, looking at goods and services, and having an impact on the wider community. The East London Foundation Trust, which delivers health services to the community, their Marmot Mountain, um, they took our business report and they said, where the East London Foundation Trust as a training and employment provider, we employ local people, we give them training, we think about our goods and services, how they can have a positive impact on health, and our impact on the wider community. To finish, I stick with my original six recommendations. Give every child the best start in life, 
education and lifelong learning, fair employment and good work for all, having enough money to have a healthy life, healthy and sustainable places and communities, and taking a social determinants approach to prevention. But we've added to, in light of the COVID pandemic, tackle racism, discrimination, and their outcomes, and pursue environmental sustainability and health equity together. But we also have to address poor governance and political culture, the social and economic inequalities that have been increasing, the reduction in spending on public services, and the fact that we're not being very healthy. Often I get asked, what's the one thing you would recommend? One thing? Put a fair distribution of health and well-being at the heart of all government policy. Thank you very much. We have time now for some questions or discussion from the audience. So the people here and also uh, the people in the Facebook or Zoom, you can write your questions. So we'll be happy to answer. Mike, Professor Marco. We have some microphones.
also an interest to expand Marmot cities to Israel, perhaps. We are in a dynamics of shifting interest and responsibilities from the national system to uh, our municipalities very soon. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, a negative and a positive reason for working at the city level. The negative reason is if the national government couldn't care or was going off in a different direction, then we have to work at a level where they do care. And that's part of why we've been working with all these cities. As I showed you, I don't know why, for some reason, the national government in Britain over the last 12 years has not been very interested in talking to me. Um, I, I don't know what that's about. Um, I can tell you an anecdote some other time. But, you know, I've talked to the Liberal Democrats, the Labour Party, the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Government, Northern Ireland, it's only the Westminster government that don't seem to want to know. Uh, so we're working with cities for a negative reason, because the national government's not interested. The positive reason is, I think, what's behind your question, which is what happens, that's where people live and work. That's where it all happens. And working with city government, with the voluntary and community and faith sectors, with the health and care services, with the firefighters, the police, education, working with local services, they're much more sensitive to the reality of people's lives. Now, if national policy is increasing child poverty, that makes it much harder to work at city level because you've got to, in a sense, push back against the tide. But there's real commitment. I went to the city of Manchester two weeks ago. I mean, this is about the second or third in-person meeting I've been to since March 2020. I hardly do everything from my desk in London at home. But I went to the city of Manchester and they had produced a report based on my report for Manchester what the city was now going to do for the next five years. And the level of enthusiasm in the room was palpable. It was so great. It was wonderful. Wow, you know, we're going to make Manchester a fairer place, a better place to live. And they really wanted to make a difference despite the difficulties of the national settlement. So, yeah, I'd love to have Marmot cities in Israel. Uh, we're talking with Italian colleagues about... Marmot cities, they don't need to be called Marmot, but doing that kind of thing in Italy. Um, I've actually agreed to go to a meeting in Palermo in Sicily. They're going to have Rome, Florence, uh, Bologna, Trieste, we hope, um, in Sicily, trying to get these cities to take the same kind of action at the city level. So, by all means, um, I give you my phone number, and if you say we're going to get Israeli Marmot cities, I'm signed up. Um, thank you very much for a wonderful talk. I have a philosophy that I share with my students, which is that I have yet to encounter a government that would let good health care policy get in the way of getting re-elected. So my question is, number one, do you agree with that mantra? And if you do, what's the alternative model? You know, I feel about democracy, um, what was it, Winston Churchill said, it's the worst possible system except for all the others. And our, our democracies aren't working very well. Um, when I joked to my colleagues that I envy you the stability of your system, my gosh, um, you know, you can think how bad ours is. If, so it's not working very well. And when people think about health, in general, they think about how long it took to see the doctor 
and whether grandma was treated well in hospital when she went to hospital. They don't tend to think about, they do, they think a lot about early childhood and education and conditions for their children and working conditions, having a job and all of those important things. They don't think about them as health issues. So to get people galvanized that these, and I was listening to a discussion, it's a, out of my ken now, um, but I'm caricaturing only slightly that the 1% elite, have, so he was talking about the United States, but the 1% elite has somehow convinced the majority of the population that the policies that they're going to pursue will benefit them. They won't. They'll only benefit the 1%. On the other hand, the policies that would benefit the 60% of the population are being criticized because, as if they come from the 1% elite. So they're not doing very well in terms of getting these ideas across. At, so um, if a government said, elect us, we're in favor of proportionate, what? <laughs> you know, they, what? No one's gonna come to the, the barricade to support proportionate universalism. This is not, um, so these ideas don't get across very well into the real rough and tumble of politics. Uh, I don't know how we solve that problem. I'd like to think that those of us who are standing up for equity in health are standing up for the benefits of the large mass of the population. And it would be better for all of us if there was greater equity in health. And to achieve that, there would be greater equity in social conditions, which would be good for everybody. But we don't seem to be doing very well electorally uh, with those messages. So big issues of the, demo the democratic deficit. Hi, thank you so much for that excellent lecture. Um, I had a question coming a little bit from an immigrant perspective. You talked a lot about lower socioeconomic levels and also the discrepancy in Israel between Jews and Haredi Jews and Arabs, um, but Israel also has a large and ever increasing immigrant population, and there are obviously issues around the world right now about refugee status. How do you think that will impact um, the different countries and what are some suggestions you might have um, to solve those problems as well? Well, uh, anyway, I, I don't start with um, the importance of any particular social ethnic group. I start with look at these inequalities and can we then understand them? And I'm not qu quite sure if this is behind your question. W one of the issues um, is displaced persons um, particularly in the Eastern Mediterranean region, the number of people who are forced migrants, migrants is a sort of generic word, but displaced persons internally. I mean, look at Syrians and the impact it has both on the people who are forced to leave, but the impact on the receiving country in Lebanon, in Jordan, in Turkey, um, the situation of displaced persons and the impact on the host country. If you're a relatively poor country like Jordan or uh, Lebanon, uh, Lebanon's close to a failed state now, but, and you've got hundreds of thousands or millions of refugees. So to the extent that people are being forced through discrimination, through conflict, um, Jews know about this, of course, throughout history, uh, being forced to live in difficult circumstances, uh, whether it's economic or conflict or racism, discrimination. It's a huge issue that 
um, and a huge issue both for the receiving country, for, as it were, the losing country, and of course for the people themselves, uh, which is something we have to deal with. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, now it's working. Thank you very much for the fascinating lecture, but also for the Marmot Roadmap for Reducing Inequalities. And I'm taking your sentence, your, your sentence, do something, do more, do better. I think this is the mission of all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.